Okay, we may begin. Okay, thank you very much, Aido. Well, uh, perhaps we can wait for uh, a few minutes. I I was uh, yeah I was thinking the same. Just realized that uh, David is not yet on his seat. So let's just wait a couple of minutes or until he's back. Okay. Okay. So good morning and good afternoon and welcome everybody to our third archaeology webinar series of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and Traces Asia. Thank you again for joining us for another exciting talk about the human story. This webinar is jointly hosted and facilitated by Aido Balboa, Mylene Leasing, Dr. Rick Fuentes, and myself. The webinar series is supported by the School of Social Sciences, the Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of the Ateneo, and the RIT and its Eduardo J. Aboitis Sandbox Zone. Now, today we have with Dr. David Lord Kipanitze, again, a very prominent scientist who will take us to an important landmark in human evolution and to the earliest hominins out of Africa. Professor Lord Kipanitze is the Director General of the Georgian National Museum and head of the excavations in Manisi that brought to light so many amazing fossils. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States, a full member of the Georgian National Academy of Sciences, a corresponding member of the German Archaeological Institute, member of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts, and a member of the Academy of Europe. Dr. Lord Kipanitze has been recognized for his scientific achievements, not only in Georgia, but also by countries and academies around the world. He received the award of the Prince of Monaco, the French decorations Palm Académique and L'Ordre du Mérite, the Georgian National Prize for Science and Technology, the Rolex Award for Enterprise, and the award of the Academia Nazionale dei Lincei Fabio Frasetto. David also received the Humboldt Research Award of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and was awarded with the Goethe Medal as an official distinction of the Federal Republic of Germany. He is a prolific writer who has authored more than 150 scientific articles published in journals such as Nature, Science Magazine, or the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's really a great pleasure having Dr. Lord Kipanitze with us today. And let me now hand over the microphone to Mylene, who has been working with David since several years and uh, organized the first exhibition of the famous Manisi fossils together with associated artifacts in Southeast Asia, to be precise, right here at the Ateneo de Manila University in 2016, and I, I think many of us still remember this wonderful exhibition called The First Humans Out of Africa, The Journey of Mankind. Okay, Mylene, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alfred. Good afternoon, everyone. As both a scientist and the Director General of the Georgia National Museum, Museum David Lorkipanese has so successfully placed science, art, and culture in the service of the country, Georgia, and its citizens. 
His consistent focus on developing synergies and collaborative programs with other sectors of society locally and with international entities has propelled the Georgia National Museum into a globally recognized institution. David's vision for heritage has created much value for his country, boosting the appreciation and awareness of Georgia by the rest of the world. In archaeology, the partnerships David has initi initiated have been instrumental in elevating the skills and the capacity of Georgian scientists who regularly work and publish with the most respected international experts in the field of discipline. The discoveries that he has made in human evolution have raised the profile of Georgia in the scientific world. There is much to learn from David's leadership, especially in terms of effective and efficient handling of resources, be it material, financial, or human, and others. More importantly, this has been possible because of his generosity and openness to working with outsiders like myself, for which I am extremely grateful. We have sent three Filipino participants to the Dumanisi Paleoanthropology Field School in Manisi, Georgia, which is a truly amazing and priceless learning opportunity. In 2016, we were partners for the exhibit First Humans Out of Africa, The Journey of Mankind. David Larkipanisi came to Manila in February that year to launch this event at the Ateneo de Manila University to the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. We then took this exhibit to seven universities in Metro Manila and have since continued to deliver lectures about this to other schools on Zoom even during the pandemic. In 2017, with David and the Georgia National Museum, we collaborated with the Ministry of Education and Culture of the Republic of Indonesia through Dr. Harry Widyanto, whom you would have met earlier in this series, and the Embassy of Georgia in Jakarta for the joint exhibition of prehistoric air heritage at the National Museum of Indonesia. It was the first time an event bringing together and highlighting the early human pasts and the paleoanthropologists of Georgia and, and Indonesia was ever held. Throughout the pandemic, we have continued to work with David and his team with Filipino students participating in the online version of the Dimanisi Paleoanthropological Field School since they had the agility to immediately pivot into this new venue for learning. We have then done this for two years with Filipinos making up up to 20% of the participants online. While we look forward to being in Dumanisi once more as soon as the world reopens, for now we are thankful to have with us no less than the primary investigator of this exceptional human evolution site. Before I turn you over to Dr. Rick Sir. Rick. It's my lead. So for the abstract of this talk, in spite of many exciting paleoanthropological discoveries, the early evolution of genus Homo and the number of species is still shrouded in mystery. The hypothesis that early Homo represents one variable species versus multiple species is still in progress. Excavations of the site of Dimanisi in Georgia bring new knowledge about evolutionary history of early Homo. Over the past decades, this site has yielded a treasure of a unique series of 1.8 million year old cranial and post cranial hominin fossils. Along with many well-preserved animal fossils and quantities of primitive stone artifacts, this is the richest and most complete collection of indisputable early Homo remains from any single site with a comparable stratigraphic context. The discoveries document the first expansions of hominins out of Africa and into Eurasia and demonstrate that this was neither due to increased brain size nor to improved technology. Despite certain anatomical differences between the Dmanisi specimens, we do not presently see sufficient grounds to assign them to more than one hominin taxon. Thus, the Dimanisi assemblage offers a unique opportunity to study variability within an early homo population. The research presented new evidence on the evolutionary biology of early homo and challenges the existence of different homo lineages in Africa. For this afternoon's talk, Early Humans Out of Africa, the Manisi Perspective, we welcome Dr. David Lloyd Kipanidze. Professor, the floor is now Hi. yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure really to talk with you. And I have wonderful memories to be being in Manila. Oh, it's already six years, exactly six years ago. It's a pity that we are online, but I hope we will have a chance to be back, of course, uh, to see ourselves to meet each other in real life and georgia is more or less we are living pandemic life and now we are more open so you are very welcome to come back here and thank you 
for the invitation really it's always pleasure to talk with you and i don't know how much new i will tell today because manisi more or less became very known and famous but uh, what is most exciting thing in the manisi and generally in our field that we still have more questions than answers so i will try to take you back to the man is it works it works sorry uh, screen is so share Excuse me. It works? Yes. yes. Looks yeah. good. So, so thank you. So <clears throat> as already mentioned in abstracts that Manisi is the uh, earliest one of documented evidence, one of maybe, but at least very well documented evidence first humans out of Africa. But why we are studying it? You had a wonderful lectures, I know, series of lectures, and and in these lectures, different prominent scientists were talking about human evolution, and I think main point is always we are different and we are the same, right? And the same was in uh, with our ancestors. And here I put one of my favorite photos where you can see family of hominids which all they are sharing something common but they are inter they are different so study of it is still on the forefront let's say of the public interest of the science of course if you will look back it mostly connected maybe with charles darwin and with but with a theoretical approach but you could not study human evolution without fossils and uh, these big discoveries of starting from uh, Neanderthal finds and in your area, Pitakanthropos, and then epicenter moved towards Africa, for South Africa, then Nikis, and so on. So all it is continuing. So you need always fossils, right? And uh, now I don't think anybody has doubts that earliest hominids we have in Africa. Today we will talk about time period when first Homo appears. So oh, I think uh, now everybody agree that it happens around 2.5, 1.8. And this is time period where first stone tools appear, brains expansion happened, is a decrease of sexual dwarfism, and maybe first migration of early home. So it's what you can see in every textbooks. Uh, and it's still like this. The question who and first went out of Africa was discussable issue. I don't think that we finally solved it, you see. Uh, simply, I think we have more evidence today than we had maybe several decades ago. And this question, when, who, and why left Africa, at least why they left, it's still questionable. I will try today to tell you a story from one episode on human evolution, which helps us to see a big picture. At least with, so usually you are using different episodes, many episodes to come to the one point. And here is vice versa. We have one episode and we will try to extrapolate it. So this question, when, who, and why spread out of Africa was discussable issue. And this is uh, one of classical uh, explanation in textbooks that when humans left out of Africa, it happens when you have larger brain, larger body size, and completely terrestrial behavior. So it's clear and advanced stone tools. 
this chaos culture. So anyway, it's a Homo erectus story, which is more or less was prevailing view and still stay. But uh, today evidence and particularly the Manisi evidence shows that it's everything is not so simple. And either larger brain or body size or advanced culture was not real main uh, reasons why our ancestor decided to leave their homeland and spread worldwide. And in this case, I think Manisi is uh, one of the best evidence to invalidate these points, and I will go through it during my lecture. So I remember this was picture of uh, five, six years ago. We have not many Homo erectus fossils in the world. So this is an issue that uh, it's an old paleoanthropological joke that you have more paleoanthropologists than human fossils. So more or less is true up to date. So you have not much evidence and you are searching for a new one. I don't think uh, many scientists were considering Caucasus as a place which could have uh, answers on these big questions on human evolution. So you can see where we are. You see this a small territory between two water, big water systems. And plus, you see the Caucasus, which is a big water, uh, mountainous range, which in fact is an advantage because it protects uh, cold mesas from the north. So, so if we, you will look on this small territory, it has own advantages. And uh, one of key of these advantages is that this is one of the biodiversity hotspots. You see the Caucasus. At the world we have today, 35, I think, or 36 uh, biodiversity hotspots, hotspots, and which have very rich and uh, diverse nature. But what Caucasus had, and what is exceptional here, we can we have a chance to study evolution. So in uh, this territory, you have different, you have documented different parts of the uh, different episodes of the development of nature, starting from early story of hominoids. It's uh, not today's topic, but I will just mention that we have uninterrupted maybe evidence of periods and plus we have refugees. And when you will look today's uh, nature, you can see very big diversity in small territory. So you have uh, all vertical, you have all uh, natural zones and you have vertical zonality on very small territory. So this show it's an advantage and another evidence simultaneously you have big numbers of archeological sites. Here I just showed all uh, uh, the sites from Stone Age period until Neolithic. And, but you can see only lower Paleolithic sites, it's almost more than 87 is documented ones in this very small territory. So if you will, uh, say what could be reason to study this territory to make research and what could be potential this is a one evidence you can see very diverse nature plus well-preserved geological evidence of it and plus uninterrupted cultural story and uh, Mylan mentioned my work is to be a director of National Museum. So more or less I'm dealing with different time periods, not my own research, uh, but you know, to supervising, to entering. And I could say that for sure that there that exists any period of humankind where you have not evidence in Caucasus. And 
myself, I can say that we have important finds, not of early Paleolithic, also middle, upper Paleolithic, including transition from hunter-gatherer to Neolithic and early denizens of agriculture. So this is introduction to say that it was big chance to find here new human fossils, which is now so important for research, but it's not by chance, it's not chance by chance, because it has the, as I told you, platform, may I say, where you have uh, uh, diverse resources, the very diverse uh, environment, and plus uninterrupted cultural story. So to coming back our history, I can tell you that in the 90s, before the Dmanisi finds came out, most of scientists consider that the first humans out of Africa were one million years old. They have they have larger brain, larger body size, and more advanced stone tools. As much as I showed in, in uh, this uh, slide from textbook. And it was not fully expectable that you could have something somewhere in Georgia, very far away from Africa to have evidence, important evidence of human presence and the human presence. As you may, or most of you know that Manisi has also very interesting discovery, st story of discovery. We have this medieval city, which is, may I say, on the roads of, uh, crossroad of different uh, trade routes, even Silk Road, where we have this medieval city called Manisi, which was important city for Eastern Georgia in medieval time, particularly in Georgian Renaissance time, let's call it between 9th century, 9, 10, 11, 12th century. So, and it was, so far it was important for Georgian history. We had excavations here since early mid 30s. And this was excavations for medieval history. And during this research, you can see where we are. You see that it's a promontory. And being promontory for medieval city, just, so developing city on promontory had very practical reason. It was well fortificated from different parts. So, but this promontory itself became one of the spots, may I, may I say, hot spots in different, uh, for different <coughs> research for different time period. Anyway, so you can see where we are and here in one of the medieval, uh, medieval uh, spots, or this is a medieval uh, uh, was found the teeth of tooth of the rhino, and uh, since it was in 1983, and since that became that below this medieval setting, you have something very early, at least one million years old. This is a rhino which is connected, which is identified as, by old classification, it's uh, Dicerorinus etruscus etruscus. Today, where you, the paleontologists are using Stephanorinus etruscus etruscus. Anyway, this is a group which was one million years ago, uh, which was extinct around one million years ago. So if you will look on geologically, you can see here you are, the promontory is between two rivers and this promontory is formed by volcanic rocks and where we have excavations. And now what we do have very big, I would say that advantage that we have very good dates. You see that we have three stratum, different stratums, and it's important to see the Zemo Erosmani 
which is in fact last year our team found already stratified site another 20 kilometer from Duanisi. It's not today's topic I talk, but what I wanted to say is that beside of this famous classical Dumanisi, we have another site which is just 20 kilometers from here, but it means, and which is also well dated uh, uh, by Argon Argon dating. So what we can say that this is also well stratified site now. We have um, the volcanic lava, which is 1.85, and above it, very near, we have 1.76. So all history happened somewhere between 1.85 to 1.76. To see the formation of the site and to have the um, to have the to imagine, let's say how. You can see the, how after volcanic eruption, you see, you can see the first topography of site. Then it was filled, you see, by sediments. And later you can see these galleys and tunnels inside of it. We call it like with my colleague, uh, Professor Reed Ferring, who we already 30 years were working at least 25 years. And now we understood mechanism of site formation. So it took a while to understand it. It's like, may I say, pseudo cars, pseudo caves, you see. But you know, the sediments are not as um, solid. They were not as solid. So if, uh, and all these uh, narrows or barrels, what you can see, uh, in this uh, new, it's a wonderful opportunity for to have a dance, carnival dance, or even human dance, for humans maybe. But at least what I wanted to say that this is ideal sedimentation place for preservation of the bones. All these holes in different way by water, by carnivores, they were. Uh, <coughs> There were sedimentation, what happened and, uh, of the full uh, bodies of animals. And this was, I think, main reason why it's so well preserved. I used this picture many years ago, you know, had lecture in Pittsburgh and, you know, Pittsburgh is city of uh, Andy Warhol. And, I was just joking that you have Andy Warhol time capsule and we have Tumanisi time capsule. And in fact, it's half joke. It's uh, not fully joke, may I say. But of course, a joke to connect with Andy Warhol, but Tumanisi is a time capsule. And uh, when in what I showed in this previous slide, this is an incredible opportunity of the quick deposition quick deposition and then covering by sediments. So time uh, of around 1.8, whatever we will say, these details, you have this opportunity of the, to see this spot, which is really time capsule. And you can see the modern analogs, how it could be in Dmanisi time. But what I wanted to say that one of the biggest advantage what we do have in Dmanisi is that it's a quick sedimentation as I told, quick deposition and plus contemporaries of the elements. I mean, stone tools and different faunal remains including hominids. So you can see it's also one of typical picture of Tumanisi where you can see stone tools and animal bones. So to start it, see if I convinced you, we have, we know time period, we know more or less mechanism of, uh, mechanism of uh, deposition. 
And I would add that the age of Timanisi is supported this idea of the absolute dates is by paleomagnetic and also biostratigraphy, particularly by rodents. So uh, all these components, all these methods show that, as I told you, we're around 1.8. Plus, now if we will talk about environment. Of course, we're the best evidence comes from fauna and you can see how well preserved fossils we do have. Very often we have animals in anatomic uh, uh, they are in, uh, preserved in anatomic positions. See how well preserved and both we have you saw the deers, you saw the different, but you can see, for example, this is one <laughs> very beautiful. Uh, it's a saber tooth cat, which is a homotherium. You can see how well preserved is it. And study of it gives us chance, you know, when we're talking about opportunities, and I'm happy to know that the students are listening to this lecture. The Manisi's uh, strength is in opportunities, right? If you will look, for example, this fossil, right? The one is always, you are doing classical anatomical studies. But now with well-preserved fossils, we can reconstruct also biomechanical of it. And you can see how they were chewing or how was their movement of this element, these animals. But plus I will mention also this opportunity to get more molecular biological information. So this is, a, a, let's say artistic reconstruction of some elements, which will helps us to reconstruct environment. And we can say that it's really a semi-dry warm climate, warm climate. And, and this is combination. I always hated to say word mosaic because it was always like stamp. But in this case, we really have mosaic environment where you have open areas and as well as forest, uh, forest, uh, part. And you see that this is also geographically, you are in some way uh, on foothills, plus another big influence on the environment you have by water system. When I showed at the beginning, Caspian Sea, Caspian Sea had influence on this territory too. So there are big, there are another opportunities to study big questions of climate changes, environmental changes and so on. So we, it's, uh, we have more than 50 groups of the different, uh, uh, different um, animals. And uh, we can talk about, as I told you, environment. We can talk about biogeography. And it's interesting when I mentioned about medieval crossroad of trade crossroad of Tumanesi, it was also a crossroad for animals. You see, and, uh, even 1.8 million years ago, where you have both Eurasian origin and some of African origin. But it's a very specific issue. And I think it, it will be interesting, maybe it's another lecture to go uh, by group by group and to talk about origin and how also the Manisi chain some point uh, views about which species are endemic. For example, it was for some rodents, and also we can discuss, for example, origin. when the ostriches came to Caucasus, it was the Manisi time, or we have earlier migrations, how it can be connected with big questions like Messinian crisis. And so, and so the, it's the big window to study biogeography of found. But another opportunities are here, this is a part of, Professor Abbe Salon Weku, uh, who was discoverer of first 
rhino born with chains to Manisi kiss from medieval to uh, prehistoric side, but it's very symbolic and we're keeping, uh, he has in his hands with my colleague, Bochakila, so this big skull of rhino. Rhino is some way iconic species for the Manisi. This was a species which was first discovered, which as I told you, put the Manisi on as a early prehistoric site, but also Rhino was first group from where we had a chance to get uh, first proteomes. So let's say first molecular information from this time period. And this was a paper, this project, which we designed with my colleague and friend Eske Willerslav from Copenhagen University is this idea also how we can get information, biomolecular information from the Anisi fossils. We tried from different groups and most successful was uh, Rhino and with colleagues, uh, Enrico Capellini, uh, Dr. Walker, anyway, so it's a very big group. We were able now to show that evolutionary story using molecular biological information, in this case, proteins, which is, I think, one step away to go DNA. In fact, we also tried for humans, and it was less successful, but it's also another paper in nature, you can see it. So my point is that when I mentioned about opportunities, it's another opportunity to study groups using this modern, and with my colleague, Lorenzo Rook, we were talking that Manisi is maybe founder of molecular paleontology approach. So this is how these fossils helping us to be forefront on big scientific issues. Now let's come back to, or maybe the start to talk on hominids which created, which is, which gave the Manisi this importance and uh, so much glory. It started from this Joe in 91 and you know, this, I remember very well, every moment is 34, uh, how many years? It's 31 years ago, 30 years ago when we found this jaw and how the Manisi suddenly became important for human paleontology. I just will remind you that there were big discussions in 90s. Is it Manisi primitive and uh, as a, and also it was discussable age, but for paleoanthropologists uh, were main issue, were what is most important? General architecture and morphology of this mandible, which is very primitive. You can see it's very robust, it has no chin, but also the question was maybe this reduction of third molar, so more developed, uh, developed and modern dentition is a sign of the advanced features. So it was a discussion, our group under supervision, my professor Leo Gabunia, we were proponents of idea that Manisi is a early, early hominids and this is, this uh, may I say progressive feature is a uh, we call it inadaptive, uh, inadaptive evolution, which happened in different groups. So anyway, it was discussion and at the end, the main point was to find, to have a, a scars which more or less close this discussion, at least uh, more people were convinced that the Manisis really were the early hominid site and this, their features are very primitive. And now you see that we had uh, several skulls, five skulls. This is one, 2700, which was also a cover story of National Geographic. And this one you can see. So 
this is reconstruction uh, this one of this car it's it was interesting uh, how many new information you were getting studying these cars for example this car 5 which is uh, was found in 99 for some scientists this was considered as a, another species so uh, one of my colleague after publishing our paper in 2000 science where we presented to skull and of course we showed also the previously found mandible uh, our uh, our conclusion was that this is homo erectus type uh, group maybe more close to homo ergaster with own affinities so uh, there was in science magazine uh, another paper of let's say comments of one of my colleague who was writing well here are three different species and his arguments were on morphology but you see very simple reconstruction after some time showed that all these features, what you can see as a difference, were just secondary taphonomic influence. So this all it was just deformed. It's very easy to say now nah, speak now, but what I wanted to say that it gave us chance to clean, let's say, secondary influences. And same is with aging. One of the when you will see. On the Manisi, for example, this uh, skull four, we found it in 2002. It was published in 2005 also in Nature magazine. This, and I will speak a little bit more about this car, but it's completely dangerous and very rare when you have so old individuals. So advantages, you can see, not just morphological difference. And if you will, for example, see this here, the Manisi between chimp and modern human, you can see how primitive and small it is. The beginning when I mentioned about the prevailing views about um, uh, <coughs> Uh, the brain capacity, <laughs> you can see how small is it. And the prevailing view was it should be around 1000 cc and here we have less than 600. So we have five skulls now. I will not go in details of uh, each one, maybe it will come back to the skull five, but you can see five skulls from one episode and we can we have many arguments to say that all are contemporaries and all five are different biological age so this is first time maybe for this uh, time period we can speak about population biology so this is another opportunity with skulls but these humans should have not just skulls and we have some postcranial bones this is also one of our papers i think 2007 nature where you can see what we do have and um, to make this um, conclusion on uh, what we do have what we learned from um, postcranial bones so we can say that arms are still very primitive and legs are much more modern so which shows that it were very good runners, endure runners. So to summarize this Manisi hominids who had a small brain, they were quite small, height was uh, not, they were small, may I say, but with primitive arms. So primitive brain, uh, skulls, primitive arms and more developed legs. So this is more or less portrait, and I will come back to these issues, but what they were doing. So best evidence, what we do have is our stone tools. And at the beginning, we may, I mentioned that prevailing view was that humans who left Africa, they should have not developed stone tools. 
So um, you are an archaeologist, you know the stages, right? Uh, then what we have in the Manisi, we have most primitive stone tools, like let's call all the one stone tools. If you will look on it on left, you have the Manisi tools and on the right, bifas is what was expected to find, more developed with symmetry. So what we got in the Manisi, all material and we have now 10 tower more than dozen thousand of stone tools and all they are primitive all the one type and all are coming from adjacent area from nearby river so all i think there are already three theses is working on it and all shows all coming to this conclusion so you had not any developed stone tools, all are primitive, and all are, as I told you, from nearby rivers. We also had uh, some, let's call it manual pots, you know, when you have um, unmodified stone tools, you are calling them manual pots. But now this manual port, let's say, had a function, and we think with different arguments that what we can see in the Manisi, it was real, let's call it power scavenge, more aggressive scavenging. And this artistic reconstruction, which has been done by Mauricio Anton, I think shows more or less how it, these hominids can behave in this time period. So this is more or less. Another indirect evidence of behavior is through this edentulous, Edentulous uh, skull. No, it was very it's earliest evidence, maybe, where you have completely toothless skull. And it's clear that it lost uh, teeth during the life. But generally, we have a new studies on pathology which will come out. It was under direction. I mean, but well, actually, I will not talk about results today, but it's it will come in special issue in the Journal of Human Evolution, where you can learn after this research what we had. We studied different diseases which are documented in uh, the Manisi hominids. In here, I will speak just general morphology that it's a uh, toothless hominid which survived without his several years. As you know, it's, we had this evidence, we had maybe one chimps, but in this case also it's a, we have a temporary zone. So to survive in temporary zone where you have summer clear seasonality in winter without vegetation is not easy. So uh, we think that Maybe it's a little bit exaggeration of this picture, but generally we have the first traces of solidarity. And um, I recently saw one book, What Makes Us Human? And this uh, cow, uh, our discovery was presented as uh, one of the arguments, what, uh, what makes us humans. So what I wanted to say that uh, we can speak here about group behavior and Manisi shows that you have some kind of social interaction. At least this is a hypothesis. So to go back and to summarize, we can see now and that there's now scientists agree and uh, this is scientific community that all the spread of genus homo at least happened 1.9 million years ago in between. I think, uh, I still think that Manisi could not be earlier. So it's just simply luck. I'm sure that in Near East, uh, you should have earlier sites, but you know, uh, our archaeology depends on luck and I hope one day others will have this luck to find it. So what we got as a, now, you see that it's more than 1 million, it's 1.8. You see how small they are and how primitive stone tools are. So 
all these ideas why humans left Africa from the beginning is invalidated. Uh, I think we can easily, to summarize, say that reason of so it happened much earlier, we thought they are much more primitive with primitive behavior. But why they left Africa, I think it's still questionable. Recently, I think it was a few months ago, there were papers in Penias about carnivory of Homo erectus. Even the idea which was strongly accepted in scientific community that one of the reason of Homo erectus spread was that he became carnivore. Here is also the question with the evidence and facts. But I wanted to say that this issue, why Homo erectus, if it's Homo erectus or earlier form of Homo erectus spread out of Africa, it's a more multiple reasons, I think. And it's maybe it was it's still to be investigated, what I wanted to say. And uh, I think the Demanisi skull, where we are to speak about where to put them, right? Where you finally, we should say, who are Demanisi people? We said, uh, I tried to explain and to present how they looked, where they lived, what they were doing. But which taxonomic, which name we should give? And this is one of my favorite slides, and I think I will use it always in my lectures. This is Skull 5 to Manisi. You know, it was it's the most complete one I ever found from this time period, and well, you know, very well preserved. Then, if you will use these three parts in different places, like Joe, face and uh, another part of skull, you can see here three different species. Some, what I wanted to say that you see that combination of this skull where you have very small brain, but we have the jaw here, you have a face with prolonged, a long face, which is more similar to Homo erectus. Teeth are very similar to Homo rudolfensis or early Homo habilis. Brain is less than 600, this has 542. So it's a combination, erectus, habilis. So what is? So I think uh, I will say that this Manisi exactly gives us opportunities to look on different characters which we considered before as a morphological character, to look on them as an individual characters. And with opportunity, I mentioned uh, that you have population biology approach is for it. So, uh, and you know, this skull five, which was real famous skull five, which is, as I told you this question, which species is it? And you see how small brain is. Recently, one page, uh, page we published, which is leading by my uh, Zurich colleagues, uh, Christoph Zolikofer and Marcia Ponce de Leon. This was a study of the Manisi brain. And still the question is, this is from here, and to compare the Manisi brain morphology from many different elements, which is exist, you see, for modern and also I think here you can see difference between the Manisi and the Sangira, you see how small is it. And uh, the final uh, conclusion of this uh, paper was that also <coughs> the Manisi brains are <coughs> not just small, their morphology is more ape-like than homo-like. So uh, this is uh, uh, another example that we can learn more. We can learn more from Manisi. And in the end, <laughs> before we will give them final name, I think 
it's better to keep this name. It's a home erectus with some local variation where we can use this word Georgicus. And uh, to be, you know, summarized the Magnesi, which we are proud to say this is credible of West Europeans and we're using for marketing very strongly. I would say that, yes, it's the first humans, documented human evidence in Eurasia, but which and this group gives us chance to speak about very early story of Homo. And still, if we are either we will use it, approach or lumpers or splitters, still we are in the evidence of very early story of starting. I will still use the word Homo erectus, uh, a species which maybe was most long lived species in the world. If, but new genetic studies maybe will give more details about it. And uh, my point and uh, what our conclusion with whole group and uh, you know, our research group is now many dozen of sciences all over the world is that we still many questions in the Manisi. This is a uh, real wonderful opportunity to look from different perspective story of early homo, call it homo erectus or whatever new name. And we can look on, as I told you, and I let people uh, repeat it on story of itself, anatomy, from different perspectives, not just morphology, also molecular, as well as environment and different groups of study and behavior. So, and also, when you see to finalize, it's interesting for public, it's one of reconstruction of skull five. We're continuing different work and we just opened Trust a new museum next to the Manisi and I hope we will open another one exactly at the site. It's 30 kilometers from site. So I think uh, the Manisi and uh, the story helps us to combine science, culture and education. So it belongs not just to Georgia, it's, uh, story of humankind and uh, I'm very happy that uh, I'm working there and I have so wonderful colleagues with whom I can share our results and we're continuing to work and it's wonderful opportunity to tweet past and future so thank you I think I'm a little bit over time but thank you Thank you, David. Thank you very much. There's always something new to learn about the Manisi. Thank you for being very generous with your information. Uh, Alfred, I believe we might have some questions. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mylene. Thank you, David, for that wonderful lecture and, and for presenting all the information of, of really a very unique site actually a very unique region so the the but what impresses me is that uh, the caucasus regions and and obviously the very favorable environmental conditions of the region like the fast sedimentation uh led to a really exceptional preservation of fossils and cultural mater material and and this density of of early sites uh around manisi is really outstanding. And, and of course, now I'm I feel even more eager uh, to, to visit Manisi uh, and, and uh, the new uh, Bolnisi Museum. Uh, I hope it will be soon possible. Right now, we, we don't really know uh, how uh, it will be to, to, to travel, uh, but it's really an amazing place. Not, not to mention it's a, a wonderful, landscape. So thank you very much again for, for giving us this opportunity and uh, introducing us to, to this exceptional site uh, of, of Manisi. So you, you already uh, posed uh, the very important question in your talk, why they left Africa. 
But I, I think also that Manisi finds, they, they raise again the question, what did it take to go out of Africa and, and move into Asia and then spread all over the, that large uh, Asian continent? And, and perhaps we expected more cognitive and, and behavioral advancement. Um, and, and we used to think about that uh, early hominins need certain traits to be able to move out of Africa until there were the Manisi discoveries. So th this uh, capacity of, of, of a mobility, of exploring new territories, finding niches that, that can become new habitats, uh, they, they seem to, to have been present already in, in very early if not the earliest hominins. Am I more or less? Uh, yes, right? of course. Uh, yeah, you see, um, uh, there are um, there are no for let's say put things that way. I don't think there are no reasons why it should not be. Why not? The question is, and it's. You see that most of these time period sites are very difficult to find, right? It's a question of preservation, you see. Even in, uh, you see, without Manisi, it would be dif difficult to imagine it, and it was complete chance. So I'm for it, you see, and uh, looking on uh, different uh, sites. So, my only answer will be keep up searching. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I have excavated at the Manisi and we have also sent a couple of other archaeology students to participate in the Dimanisi field school. And we were supposed to send the fourth one uh, in 2020, but of course the pandemic happened and that changed everything for everyone. David, you mentioned earlier that you believe that Manisi is probably not the earliest uh, uh, site for the old for, for the evidence of the oldest spread of humans out of Africa, which is quite unusual from a paleoanthropologist where normally the um and Okay, maybe I'm being too controversial when I say this, but people would be so protective of uh, being the first or the earliest. But you see. Oh. Well, I think we, we lost my link. We lost my, my link. Let's see if you can connect to another. Um, account. Maybe, meanwhile, may, may I ask uh, you another question? Uh, of David? course, with the pleasure. Uh, no, uh, I, I'm not a paleoanthropologist uh, myself, so I, I'm quite uh, amateurish with, with that. Uh, but when I think of, of brain size and how relevant brain size is, and, and we seem to all give a lot of relevance to brain size and to the development and growth of, of the human brain, uh, especially when it comes to cognition, to behavior, intelligence, and, and more complexities and, and technologies. But um, I remember, uh, not very exactly, but I re remember that my, my old paleontology professor would cite as an example about what brains can actually do, even if they are small, he, he would mention the, the, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who was apparently a very small person and said his, his brain uh, size was only 800 cc. So way below the average modern human brain. And still he was one of the greatest minds uh, of his time. <laughs> you see, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we should know what is the minimum, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> then go ahead. <laughs> My what is, yeah, well, I'm back, but I'm in a different location. 
what is the minimum for homo anyway uh, in, in terms of brain size? See, when I was a student, we were teach that oh, it starts from 600, you know, mm -hmm. it's homo habilis has 600, but now you see it's a less and we're getting another opportunities to approach. See, the story of homo erectus is now widely inter interested. Right? Many people are interested, different scientists, you know. I heard, I listened lecture, for example, that homo erectus had ability to speak. They were not, I didn't find real arguments uh, clearly, but this was more linguistic approach that it has opportunities and it was explained with science icons. But I wanted to say that um, Homo erectus and whatever we will call the Manisi, it was well adapted this time period and had everything enough to survive and adapt, right? And so what was, and maybe this is a portrait of some breakthroughs, maybe if this was breakthrough, these groups to do it. Because the, all these questions, you know, uh, as I told you, communication, which is very important for these uh, points, you see. Why you need, they need brain, right? Brain, <laughs> the brain is how brain functions, right? <laughs> it's important, is, you see, and what is. Uh, so I think uh, what we are getting in our field now, more and more opportunities to go to big questions of humanity. That's it. What would be uh, an example of those big questions that Luminacy is able to answer? Well, tell, tell me, you see, we will start with human behavior, right? Early homo behavior, which mm -hmm. is, uh, I don't think it's uh, more interesting for humans, anybody in the world, what their ancestors were doing, right? Who they were. This is an advantage of story of human evolution that it has wider public interest. And uh, when I mentioned this opportunity <laughs> to getting, for example, molecular information from uh, bones, it means that this well-preserved fossil has another advantage. I'm sorry, uh, can we go back? I, I, asked, I asked the question earlier, but my internet got cut and I may have missed your answer. Repeat question. Uh, why I am looking, yeah. Yes, why you why said I'm not that there could defending be... its first question. Can I say honestly? I'm spoiled, maybe. Because you know? <laughs> <laughs> when... Uh, no, but it's joking. You see, I had this big uh, privilege in my life mm -hmm. to lead uh, two very important projects for my country. First Europeans, sure. let's say, and also a story of West Wine. You, see. you know, earliest wine story. And, and it's not just to study earliest, you know. You should uh, try correctly and professionally present these facts in this time period. And then uh, if you are more luck, you have more luck, you will be first or today you are first, tomorrow it could be different. I see. Uh, I'm frankly you. saying that uh, if you are not searching on new horizons and new aims, so it doesn't make sense. Thank you. That's very inspiring. Actually, it should be uh, an inspiring frame of mind for the younger uh, paleoanthropologists and researchers nowadays. Rick, Alfred, do we have other questions? I would. Well, for, first of all, I know I, I got the excited in them thinking if we should have a, another talk about the first wine. Uh, one day, which which is a very fascinating topic uh, as it well. Is. No, I can do it immediately, but I have <laughs> how many? Forty minutes, I think. <laughs> Still. So yes, that that's that's a another topic worth uh, listening to. It's a fascinating story. Yeah, indeed. So, 
Uh, oh yeah, what what I what I liked, I, I mean, I, uh, I I share this uh, with you, uh, David. I also like that that slide you presented with with a one skull that that has the features of of three different hominins, and and this this demonstrates the, this in, incredible variability of the skeletal remains uh, at Manisi and especially the skulls. So um, do do I understand? Then this correctly, if if we say if the five skulls from Manisi would have been found at at five different sites, they would probably have been identified as as five different uh, hominins, five different species. Well, at least three. I don't know five, mm. but at least three, four, <laughs> three at least. I don't know. And still, there are scientists who think on it that way. Mm. You see. Even That's so exactly. at the same time and, but and you see, time. it's uh, I'm not blaming. You see, the question is how all is on the world today database, right? How rich database you have and how then you can correlate it. It's not just in paleontology, but it's the same <laughs> in everywhere, right? And the question is here, how rich database you will have with uh, knowing details like secondary influence, you see. A secondary influence I mentioned, it's uh, age, remodeling by different reasons, taphonomy, you see. Also ontogenesis, because you do not have right ratio of ontogenesis everywhere, you see. These are the questions still developing, you know, for early hominids, you see. This is, I think it's a future that way. And when you have findings like Manisi or Atapuerca, the Sima, where you have all in South Africa, and now this hominid lady, when you have real evidence from the one spot you see, this is uh, very important for future, exactly from this approach. I think it's a big, uh, may I say, a big story of science development, I think, and philosophy of the science. So, so we can expect uh, a lot more revisions of, of the human fossil record and, and the interpretation in the future. I, I, I think that's why this uh, subject is interesting. You know, it's not mathematic. You are solving theorems and go away, right? It's a, something which you are keeping with. You see, importance, findings, opportunities. You know, uh, opportunities to be. Uh, let's say useful, not just for your general interest, but you know, now you are getting with all these molecular uh, studies, you can study pathogenesis, yeah, and this can be used for future for the, may I say that, uh, for treatment, right, to be uh, very simple. Same when you are studying uh, the real details of uh, environmental changes, right? So that's, uh, I think, future. it's a philosophy of studying past, how to use for future. So you're saying that with the existing data already, and there's a lot that has been gleaned from the Manisi materials and the fossils that you've found, <clears throat> that with developing technology, a lot more uh, research results, a lot more new uh, wisdom and knowledge can come out of that, of those materials. Uh, yes. Yes, and um, I don't know, that's a question. So it's ongoing processes, I think. This is ongoing processes. Wonderful. So, uh, Alfred, do we have any more questions? Rick? So we look forward, David, are you having uh, the field school this year? Are you planning on having Yes, I school? hope we will have. I don't mm -hmm. think, I, I don't know if Anne is here. We'll try it, yes. Mm -hmm. so you are uh, yes, I am here. Hello, everyone. Oh, hi, Annie. <laughs> hi. Hello. So everyone, this is Dr. Annie Markalashvili. Thank uh, you. Coming in from Zurich. 
Uh, hello. <laughs> so uh, yes, we, we are heading to school. Hello. <laughs> So that's something to look forward to, and we hope to see you there, Taylor, yes, Annie, I... and the rest of the team. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for time. this uh, wonderful series and initiative. It's a, it's a great thing you are doing. Thank you. Um, Annie also started uh, the Dimanisi Paleoanthropological Online field school and that was a great series and one of the earliest uh, to happen in the pandemic. It was like as soon as the pandemic hit, we switched Annie to this new venue for learning and that was a great opportunity for us in the Philippines. A lot of uh, students were able to learn about Manisi because of that. Yes, um, so we, we had this online lecture course and I think it was pretty successful. So we want to keep up the platform. So the idea is that when hopefully everything will be fine and we will be able to run the field school. Uh, I mean, the world has gone a little crazy. So, but uh, if we run the field school, I would like to include the online platform as well so that it's accessible for everyone. That's a wonderful <laughs> concept. Yeah, definitely. But um, the, the field work this year, they, uh, it, it will continue uh, more or less uh, regularly. Yes, we, we have not, uh, we, we never uh, stopped to have the field work there. It was mm -hmm. just on a smaller scale, um, but we could not um, uh, allow having of the COVID situation. It's yes. too risky, too high responsibility mm -hmm. and uh, um, for safety reasons, basically. But uh, the work is ongoing. We, we, we it. That's great. Fantastic. So thank you very much, David. Thank you for being with us and sharing with us this uh, fantastic information about, well, one of the, I would say, one of the most interesting, I've not been to a lot, but I've been there a few times and it really is a, an amazing place, uh, especially for uh, field school students. Uh, thank you very much for joining in, Annie. It was great to have you. Uh, and we look forward to the online version of Manisi Paleo, Paleo Anthropological Field School, even if you do get back uh, to face-to-face. -to -face. Hint, hint. <laughs> so... It was great to see you all this afternoon. We Thank expect you. to see a lot more viewers. There are a lot more viewers who are actually uh, with us on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, and they cannot be with us uh, live because, as you have seen, uh, internet is quite spotty from where we are. Thank you very much, everyone. And good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Thank you David. Thank, Thank you so much. My pleasure. So much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care. That was wonderful. Annie, are you here? Oh.